The first thing I want to do is uh, thank the Interactive Minds Center for having me here. It was a really flattering invitation, and I really welcome the opportunity to speak to you all today. Just a quick audio check. Is this, can you hear me in the back? Yeah? OK. I see a few nods. It takes me about 20 minutes to get a nod from my students in my big auditoriums at Penn. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I also want to acknowledge the University of Alaska Anchorage. So it's true that my typical appointment, my ongoing appointment, is at the University of Pennsylvania. I currently occupy a position in the Department of Economics at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And they've been very generous in their support to allow me to pursue the kinds of questions to which Michael alluded. So uh, with having said that, I want to start with getting at the, the question that has animated the research that I've been doing in, in one avenue that I've, of inquiry that I've been pursuing over the last several years. As Michael indicated, as an evolutionary psychologist, I start with a set of assumptions having to do with the design of the human mind. And I'm not going to defend many of those assumptions here today. Uh, they may come up during the question and answer period, and I'm happy to engage with those during that, during that time. Uh, but the assumptions that underlie my research do frame my research. So I make the assumption that the human mind has a particular kind of design, that it has systems that have functions. So in the same way that you have a retina and a visual system designed to solve the problem of reconstructing the world out there into a visual representation of space so that you can navigate around, um, the claim is that other parts of your brain have other kinds of functions that are designed to solve the sorts of problems that our ancestors faced during our human evolutionary history. And I'm particularly interested in morality. As Michael indicated, although at, during his, his introduction, it occurred to me that uh, putting it that way makes the work sound extremely cynical. Uh, I don't think of it necessarily in those, in those terms. Uh, what I do want to say is that when we see some interesting pattern of human judgment and behavior, people like me, evolutionary psychologists, try to make inferences about what the evolved function is. What is it for biologically? And so as you can see here, I'm interested in the, the functions of the systems, the computational mechanisms, that underlie moral judgment. And the parentheses there with the R and the functions is to sort of nod to this literature. Uh, people like John Haidt, whose work I won't discuss in too much length, they want to argue that there is no single answer to this question. And I'm completely open to the idea that other people might think that there's no single answer to this question. I'm going to provide an answer today. Uh, that proposes that there is one single answer to this question, and it's going to turn on the topic of your lecture series, which is coordination. My good friend and colleague at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Don Simons, taught me a very valuable lesson when I was a graduate student there. He said, no one's going to understand what you're talking about until they understand who you're arguing with. And in the evolutionary literature, there's been an ongoing um, set of discussions about the function of morality. So the question that I entertain is in many ways an old question. In fact, it dates back to Darwin. Charles Darwin asked this question about what morality was for. And people have been discussing this issue since in the century and a half since. Largely, the answer to this question, and I'm not going to provide a, a, a ton of background here, uh, because I want to just talk about a few issues that I find important. The traditional answer to this question has been altruism. And again, this is, in fact, what Charles Darwin thought. So Charles Darwin thought that the reason that people have moral sentiments, as he and others put it, including Adam Smith, had to do with the fact that groups of people with moral sentiments, with morality, uh, delivered benefits to one another. And by virtue of that fact, those groups did well. right? So if you're in a group that has lots of people who are doing good things for the group, as opposed to a group where there's fewer individuals doing good things for the group, uh, the former group will prosper at the expense of the latter. So altruism has been the traditional answer to this question. I think of this as the warm, fuzzy, rainbow sort of answer, that morality is good uh, and it makes us all better off. I'm going to be making an argument that it has a strategic function. Again, it's going to be surrounding this issue of coordination. And just to sort of give the, a little bit of background about how I think about this issue, I, I just want to paint a very stylized picture of the social world. So this is my extremely stylized picture of the social world that includes no morality in it. And this will also help articulate what I mean by morality, since different communities use this term differently. So um, in, in the basic world, and this is for non-human animals, it to some extent includes plants, many, many transactions are of the following type. There's two individuals, and uh, individuals 
are trying to extract benefits from others by virtue of the process of evolution by natural selection. Organisms are designed to try to uh, reproduce, to survive and reproduce, and that means obtaining those things that are necessary for survival and reproduction. So you have individuals here, this red guy, trying to extract benefits from the yellow guy. And in return, uh, the yellow guy is going to be trying to defend against the extraction of these benefits because this often comes at a cost. This is the basic dyadic interaction that is uh, the meat and potatoes of evolution by natural selection. Competition between two individuals where one individual imposes a cost on another. The way I sort of think about this is that you have agents who are designed to extract benefits and avoid uh, revenge. And in order to do that, you sort of have to figure out how to go about getting benefits from other people. So I've got this picture of Machiavelli to indicate that it, particularly among primates, you have extremely sophisticated social systems which are really good at navigating the social world to extract benefits from others. You can think of this as Machiavellian intelligence. It's been discussed in this context by other researchers. By the same token, organisms have to be in a position to defend themselves. The way to think about this is that if you are potentially a victim of some kind of perpetrator, you need to minimize your cost to yourself, to kin and allies. And the way to do that is essentially by signaling to potential perpetrators that if that individual imposes costs on you, you'll return the favor by imposing costs on them. You can think of this as a revenge system. So the reason that you get really irritated when people impose costs on you is that your ancestors who um, got irritated in that way and imposed costs on others who, who hurt them uh, initially, left more offspring than individuals who didn't do that. You have a revenge system symbolized here by the uh, American film. This goes over better in domestic audiences. This is Ennio Montoya from The Princess Bride. Anyone? Yes, thank you. All right, awesome. Uh, so this is sort of my caricature of revenge. I think these are really easy to understand in some sense. It's actually not hard to understand why people take revenge on others once you have this very simple picture of the nature of, of interaction and uh, competition. Because revenge is a good system to deter other individuals from imposing costs on you. The system gets more complicated. The story is made more complicated by this puzzling thing that I would argue humans do and essentially no other creatures on the planet do. So one thing that is true about non-human primates, for example, non-human mammals, essentially every other species you can think of, is that by and large, they don't care about transactions that don't involve either themselves, their friends, or their allies, someone with whom, in whom they have some kind of fitness interest. And this is particularly obvious when you think about uh, you know, our, our non-human primate relatives, where you have individuals who are off by themselves. Uh, if you think of a lone chimpanzee foraging in some place that no one else is foraging, by and large, other chimpanzees, they just don't care. Um, now, it, they do care if they're an ally, a relative, a potential mate, a potential rival, and so on. But humans, we care a lot about third-party transactions. That is, interactions either that individuals do by themselves or unto others, as it were. And the, the interesting thing that we do in that context is that we judge other individuals along this dimension of morality. And this is what I think morality should, should be understood as. That is, it's this notion that there's a whole set of behaviors that other people engage in such that when they do them, we label that behavior wrong. And interestingly, we desire that people have costs imposed on them for doing it. We desire that they be punished. And I want to sharply distinguish the dyadic case, revenge, from third-party moralization. So for me, revenge is very easy to understand. We know why organisms fight back when people attack them or when individuals attack them. It's defense. What we don't understand, or what I would argue, is we don't understand why it is that we care so much about this. And you can see this in extremely sharp relief when you consider all the different things that humans care about, many of which are not harmful. Right? So over time, across cultures, people have moralized all kinds of harmless transactions, which is a subject of a line of research which I won't talk to you about today. This includes things like masturbation, charging interest on loans, uh, eating certain kinds of combinations of foods, all these things in which no individual has suffered any tissue damage, no one has lost any property, right? no one is any worse off, and yet people have decided that those individuals ought to be punished by the community in which they live. From an evolutionary point of view, from my point of view, this is extremely puzzling. Given that uh, punishment is often costly for the person who is imposing it, the question is, why do third-party humans care about transactions among unrelated individuals, particularly harmless transactions? So this is the mystery that I'm interested in. 
And what I would argue is that at the present state of the literature, at minimum, what I would say is that there is debate about the function of this system. And what I'm going to do today is uh, sort of provide three papers that address this topic. The first one is a, a theory piece that articulates what I think the role of coordination is in morality. And then I'll discuss two empirical pieces, two lines of research that are coming out of the proposal that I'll make about this thing, which is the function of moral condemnation. And what we want um, a theory of morality do, to do, it seems to me, and people can disagree about this, but what I'd like a theory of morality to do is to explain what I and my former graduate student Peter Scholli have called the mysteries of morality, which is there are some weird things surrounding human moral judgment. Probably the most obvious one, which has been obvious to moral philosophers for centuries, if not millennia, is that human moral judgment is non-consequentialist. We don't use only the consequences of actions when we make inferences about moral wrongness. The second one is what I just said about third-party condemnation. As a zoological matter, humans are extremely odd in caring about what other individuals do. Um, one thing that's, that's puzzling is moralistic punishment. Why do people not only care about what others are doing, but want costs imposed on those individuals? And then one thing that I won't talk about here, but is a line of research, which we have additional data um, on, is impartiality. Uh, another thing that's weird about humans is that they will occasionally take sides against allies and kin. So or actually, uh, in the American news cycle, I'm sure you uh, heard about the bombing at the of, in the Boston Marathon, you, you had this interesting case of, an, of a relative essentially condemning the behavior. So even from a biological perspective, when usually from a biological perspective, you expect people to take the side of their kin. In the case of deep moral transgressions, people are taking the side on the reverse of their kin. Same thing happened uh, with the Unabomber in the United States, where Ted Kaczynski's brother sided against uh, him as opposed to using the moral judgment as opposed to the um, kin relationship as his side-taking mechanism. So the first thing I want to do in the service of this argument is just try to distinguish two different phenomena. And I, I'm going to kind of pound the table about this. Again, the real story here is that for those of you who are familiar with work by people like John Haidt and others, this is a distinction that has been blurred in the people who are arguing with me. So I just want to make it very clear what, where I stand on this from the beginning. So when people talk about morality, there are actually two different phenomena to be explained. This is Jiminy Cricket from uh, the Walt Disney rendition of the Italian uh, Pinocchio. And what the way I sort of think about uh, co conscience is as follows. So as we go through our days, we have to make decisions about whether or not to do something which is morally wrong. That is, you know, steal uh, Michael's laser pointer, which I'm contemplating even as we speak, um, or not, right? So the upside of taking his laser pointer is that now I don't have to buy a new one because mine's broken. Uh, the downside is that people will condemn me for it, especially since I've now confessed to my intention. Uh, I can no longer claim that it was accidental and I stuck it in my pocket as I was leaving. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about humans is that we have these conscience systems which basically suppress our doing things that are good for us but violate a rule. And this is what Jiminy Cricket did in Pinocchio, he stood on Pinocchio's shoulder and said, if there's a morally wrong thing, then you shouldn't do it. So don't go on to Pleasure Island. So I am very likely, in fact, to conform to the moral norm here of not stealing Michael's property, even though it would be beneficial for me. And my story is that the reason is that you have a system in your head which suppresses your desires to engage in acts that will be condemned by others, that what other people will consider wrong. And I think of this as a content system. So the explanation for why people conform to moral rules, I would argue, lies in the fact that we have systems to defend us against moralistic judgment. If I steal Michael's laser pointer, you'll all gang up against me, and that's going to be bad for me. There's another thing. So that's one element of morality. Why do people do the morally right thing? There's another thing that people, another phenomenon that we can explain, which is the moral judgment in the first place. So this is the question, why do you guys care about whether I take Michael Bank Peterson's laser pointer or not? Why do you care if someone in uh, France marries somebody of the same sex or not? This is on my mind because uh, this, this was a protest this morning in France about same-sex marriage. Uh, there's lots of things that, uh, for reasons that are not in my opinion, well understood, you all care about and morally condemn, even though they don't affect any of your outcomes, your tissue, your uh, property, and so on. 
And my argument here is those are two different phenomena. One is, why do people behave in ways that conform to moral rules? The other one is, why do people care about other parties' transactions? As I said, what Darwin thought was that this was all about altruism. So Darwin thought that once you have ex basically, he was trying to explain why people deliver benefits to others. And he sort of took the answer to be the one that I introduced earlier, which is that groups with more altruists did better. And he thought once he had explained that fact, he had explained morality. I think what I'm going to suggest to you today is that that doesn't get it quite right. I'm actually just going to skip to this and say he was not alone, again, to, to situate where I come from. This is some work by John Haidt. So what John Haidt says is that the explanation for morality is actually multifaceted. So what he wants to say is that morality, as he understands it, lies in systems in people's heads designed around four different sort of problems that people have to solve. Here you can see altruism is a big part of it. So protect and care for young, vulnerable, and kin. Uh, this is his uh, reciprocal altruism story here, which is people uh, are able to get benefits by engaging in trade and exchange. Uh, this was sort of, again, Darwin's answer, right? So group cooperation. And then he also has another piece in here, which is about uh, purity, avoiding microbes, and so on. Again, but what I want to highlight here is that these are all explanations for what people do, their choices, what decisions they make. It doesn't explain why people condemn others for not doing these things. So the John Haidt explanation is what I would call a conscience explanation explaining behavior. And it seems to me that uh, if you think that Darwin was right and other evolutionary researchers are right, that the evolution of morality is explained by understanding altruism, then you would think you, you have one basic prediction that you would make, which is the following one, which is that moral psychology should be well designed to bring about welfare benefits and minimize welfare losses. And I have a separate line of work addressing this issue. All I want you to do from this slide is think about all the ways in which morality undermines welfare benefits. Again, the charging of interest, various kinds of mutually beneficial transactions that are prescribed both in modern times and historically. Not to mention things like the trolley problem, which I won't talk about here, where people say it's not okay to push one guy to save five, which is a, a deeply non-consequentialist moral position to take. So, that's sort of the brush that I want to clear away. Now I want to talk a little bit about where I'm coming from in terms of the theory. The theory starts with something which is weird about humans and the theme of this lecture series, which is that unlike almost every other creature on the planet, humans are capable of multi-individual cooperative coordination towards goals. There are other critters who do this, but they're weird. So ants do this. Uh, chimpanzees do this to some extent. Pigtailed macaques do it a little bit. A few other non-primates do it. But no one does it like we do it. We do it in many different contexts, across lots of different sorts of um, uh, situations. And most importantly, unlike lots of other critters, we can change sides in conflicts. So if you look, for example, at um, baboons, you can predict what side a baboon is going to take when a fight breaks out by just looking at their kinship relations. Baboons never switch sides switch sides. They always wind up on the same side when conflicts break out. Because humans can switch sides in conflicts, there is a, a severe problem that the human mind has to solve, which is who, who, whose side should you take when conflicts emerge. In other critters, there's other solutions to the problem. So one thing you could do is build relationships before a fight breaks out and always side with your allies. So if Michael is my best friend and I always side with him no matter what he does. If he steals your laser pointer, I said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to side with you. And if he knows this, there's a particular problem with that, which is once individuals know that others will take their side when fights break out, they tend to get into a lot of fights. This is actually not, uh, so Europe is a good place to think about this because the system of alliances that you had, particularly in the lead up to the First World War, encouraged conflict by virtue of the fact that nations knew that they could count on the support of those, individual, of those nations that were allied with them uh, using the formal mechanism of alliances and treaties. So the problem with building strong alliances is that it leads to entrapment. And as a person who is going to make an alliance, I know, or at least natural selection knows, that the problem with strong alliances is that I get drawn into more conflicts rather than fewer because of the problem of entrapment. This is well known in political science. 
Uh, another problem and uh, another possible solution to this issue of whose side to choose, which is used by hyenas among other individuals, uh, actually lots of critters do this, is you can always take the side of the, person, of the individual who's gonna win because they're big. This is, in some sense, it seems like a very nice strategy. Well, if I always take the side of the individual who's gonna win, then I'm likely to always be on the winning side, which is good for me as an individual. The problem is that with this strategy, the individual who's largest, knowing that it's always gonna win, again, can get into whatever fights it wants and can essentially become a dictator. And this is an extremely stable paradigm. So this is an extremely stable strategy because once there's a few individuals who are always supporting the biggest individual, uh, other strategies do quite poorly. So the, the problem here from, a, from the perspective of side choosing is that if you use this particular decision rule, you wind up, unless you happen to be the biggest individual, winding up being subordinate to that dominant individual. This is the solution that we think human evolution hit upon. So now imagine that fights break out in your local social community and you have to pick a side. One of the things that we know from the non-human animal literature is that the most destructive fights are the fights in which there's roughly an evenly matched pair of individuals. So if you look at butterflies and caterpillars and uh, bears and seals, in the cases in which one individual is much larger than the other, the fight is very short because the little guy just retreats. He knows he's gonna lose. The case in which you have really, really tough conflicts are the cases in which the sides are evenly matched. So if you are an observer to a conflict, suppose that you could somehow know in advance the side that every other individual was going to take in that conflict. The nice thing about that is that if everybody is using the same piece of information to choose sides, then instead of having closely matched conflicts with people siding with their friends, let's say, then you have extremely asymmetrical contact. Uh, asymmetrical contests. So that is, if we all decide that when Michael and I get into a fight, we're not gonna choose based on who's taller, which I would resist that particular decision rule, um, particularly here. Uh, instead, we're gonna say, well, let's look at their actions. Let's look at the person who did something which is in this little set of norms that we call morally bad, and we're gonna side against that individual then we as a community have a tremendous advantage, which is that now we're all on the same side. Well, in this particular case, everyone except me, since I was the guy who took the, took the laser pointer. So the nice thing about having some kind of signal that we use to choose sides is that we avoid closely matched fights. Because no one, one particular individual always wins, we avoid dictators. And because these fights are gonna be highly asymmetric, we limit the frequency of serious conflicts. The problem is that we have to somehow choose ex ante how we're gonna pick sides when the fight breaks out. And my claim is that this is what morality is doing for us. What on this view, which I wanna admit right now is a heterodox view, not widely uh, accepted in the community, well, any community, what we're arguing my colleagues and I, is that you can think of moral norms as the contents that allow us all to choose sides when fights break out. So if you look, uh, this is complicated, but if you look at uh, human social structures, these are just friendship links. Most human social structures if any, uh, are very tightly interwoven, so your friends tend to be friends with other people's friends. What this means is that in most, and we have some simulation data on this, so I won't defend this right now. What happens is that in most contexts, where you have very close social networks, when fights break out, if everyone sides with the individual who they feel closest to, that is their closer friend, fights tend to be symmetrical. So A, B, A always sides with B, uh, unless he's fighting with C, in which case he, whoops, uh, side with C. In close, the, the moral is, in closely packed social networks, when people choose based on pre-existing social ties, fights tend to be extremely equal, the worst possible case. So all we're arguing here is that what you do is when conflicts break out, instead of using your friendship alliances or your kinship, what you do is, in some cases at least, use the actions of the participants instead of their identities for choosing. Now the nice thing about this is that you can use anything. So for example, if you go back to uh, trial by ordeal or trial by combat, one way to think about these things is that it's, it's, it is a moral rule, right? 
It's using some external coordination device. It's saying whoever wins the combat or survives the or ordeal, we're going to say that they were on the side of right, and, this, and the local community is going to say, okay, we support that individual. We're going to be behind that person. And what we think is that this explains lots of different properties of morality. Again, the, the key point here is that third parties are parsing the actions of others. Here, uh, Bart Simpson is stealing a steak from Barney Rubble. Um, Wonder, all the different Wonder Womans in the world are seeing this transaction. And because ex ante, we've decided people who take without permission are the individuals who are wrong, we're going to side against Bart Simpson, uh, yeah, against Bart Simpson, and we're going to come in on the side of Barney Rubble. And to signal our condemnation of Bart, we're all going to support the imposition of costs on him. So in this case, this community is condemning this actor in a coordinated way, which minimizes these third-party costs because everyone is opposing the same individual. And as a result, everybody is siding against the same person. In cases in which you have two different offenses which have taken place, then what we do is we use the relative severity of the offenses. And we think this explains something else which is puzzling about morality, which is that it's not binary. So we, um, in additional sets of data, we this is now some work with um, a legal colleague of mine, Paul Robinson, have shown that for a huge number of offenses, people actually agree on their relative severity. And so what happens is if Barney has done something bad and Bart has done something bad, we have agreed ex ante beforehand which one is worse, and then we side against the person who's done the thing that is worse. So on this view, morality is a side-taking device that allows us to coordinate our actions against individuals who do things in this moral basket when conflicts arise. Now, just because that's the function doesn't mean that it's not culturally elaborated, and in fact it is. So in cultures in the West, we have things like police and courts, and what they do is they arbitrate this dispute using laws as the coordination device, the person who broke the law, violated some contract or what have you. In other places, they have a big man or a tribal council. Other places, it's implicit, and the community uses their intuitions as a policing mechanism. And of course, moral contents vary. So if the story I just told you is true, then we can have essentially an arbitrarily large set of moral coordination norms. So for example, the norm could be, instead of don't take people's stuff, you have to share your stuff. So it could be that the rule is, if someone wants your laser pointer, you have to give it to them. This is not a crazy example. If you look at digital rights, for example, many people have the intuition that information should be free, and that anyone who who uh, sequesters their information, whether it's a music or a book or what have you, that person is in the wrong, and the rule should be you must share everything. And I'll show you a little bit of data about this moving uh, in, in a second. So I won't defend all of this here, but we think that this kind of idea about morality, that morality is what we do to choose sides, explains many of the different features of moral psychology, including non-consequentialism. And what I want to do uh, today is just talk about two lines of work, and the first one I'm going to talk about is the act omission distinction. And I'm just going to skip these things in the interest of time. So if everything I've just told you is true, then one thing that's the, that's the, one thing that we think is important is the following: if morality is a coordination device, it becomes difficult to coordinate when nothing happened, which sounds trivially true, but as I'll show you in this line of work, we think that it's actually quite important. So I'm going to be talking now about actions and omissions. And this is in the context of a literature. This is my friend and colleague, John Barron, although, in fact, he's only my colleague, um, who's talked quite a lot about what's called the omission bias. So what I'll be arguing here is just a, about the relationship between two different ways in which the omission bias has been discussed. So he says here, the omis omission bias is the preference for harm caused by omissions over equal or less lesser uh, harm caused by acts. That is what people choose. So the classic example of this is something like, you have to, get a you have to make a decision about being vaccinated. And you know that if you get vaccinated, there's a, let's say, a one in 100 chance that you're actually going to have something bad happen to you, some reaction to the vaccine. If you don't get vaccinated, there's a five in 100 chance you're going get to get the disease. And so from a, the standpoint of decision-making theory, you should get vaccinated because your chances are lower. But in fact, what we find is that often people choose not to get vaccinated. So they choose the, the, the thing that, that is the omission, the non-action, as opposed to the, the, the action, the commission. 
So this is one puzzle in the literature, which is why do people choose not to take some action even if the outcome is good? There's a second way in which the omission bias has been discussed, which is taking it back to morality, judgment. So this is the, uh, it's a, called a bias, and we can argue about that, is when they judge harmful commissions as worse than the corresponding omission. So the, the usual example here is the one introduced by uh, John Barron and some of his colleagues. Imagine you're about to play a tennis match, and you know that your opponent is allergic to a particular salad dressing. Uh, so half the subjects are told that the person orders the salad dressing, and you don't say anything. So you omit, you do nothing, and the person then orders the salad dressing, gets sick, and can't participate in the, in the tournament. Okay, that's one condition. Another condition is the person goes to the restroom, and you order the salad dressing for him, knowing that it contains this pepper, and he gets sick and then part can't participate in the, in the tournament. Even though the intention in both cases is identical, you intended that he get sick because of the salad dressing, and the outcomes are identical, he can't play in the tournament, people judge the second one, the commission, as morally worse than the first one. So the omission bias here is the idea that um, judging acts, in the context of judging, acts are worse than omissions, holding everything else constant. This is when people have the choice about acting or omitting, they choose to omit. So those are two different phenomena, even though they're given the same name in this frustrating literature. So one of the things that we wanted to do is explore this a little bit more. And what, what I want to say is that one possibility is that because it's true that third parties condemn acts more than they condemn omissions, one way to think about the reason that people choose to omit is as a strategic response to other people's condemnation. So if I know that you're more generous with me if I do nothing as opposed to doing something, that's an explanation for why, if I'm given the choice, I do nothing. So uh, as I sort of indicated at the top of my talk, I wear a separate hat as a behavioral economist. And so we wanted to test this in the context of a very simple game. This is the dictator game, a reverse dictator game. So you come into a laboratory, in this case it's conducted online, uh, and you find out, let's say, um, Michael is given, you find out Michael has a dollar, and I'm going to have a decision to make. I'm going to take some amount of money from Michael, as it's going to turn out my decisions are limited. So I can either take a dime from him, I can take 90 cents from him, um, discrete sets of options. And then there's a third party over here, and the third party witnesses this transaction and then can impose costs on me. The punisher can reduce my payoff up to 30 cents, and we're going to use the strategy method, which just means that the punisher says, okay, if Rob takes 10 cents, here's how much I want to punish. If Rob takes 90 cents, here's how much I want to punish. If Rob does nothing, here's how much I want to punish. So the subject is just giving us a menu of conditional choices. So the design is relatively simple here. The first thing we want to do is implement an omission mechanism. So this whole study is designed to look at issues of omissions. It actually took us a while to figure out how to do this. Um, but we ultimately found a relatively simple way. So suppose that Michael's got this dollar and I can take it and I have a certain amount of time. So people do respond to choosing the Pareto-dominated option extremely harshly in both conditions. So what we take from this is that people correctly anticipate that commissions invite punishment, and omission is a strategic response to that. So here, people are using morality in this interesting strategic way to maximize payoffs. And so what I want to end with is um, another line of empirical work which again puts a slightly different spin on morality and puts it in the strategic context. So as I said, I have a, an agenda looking at victimless offenses. In this particular case, I'm looking at the use of recreational drugs. Obviously, uh, this is a fairly big politically polarizing issue in lots of different places, including the United States. And I just want to be clear, my, my question is not why do people use recreational drugs. I, I think there's pretty obvious answers to that. Uh, the question is, why do other people care if others use recreational drugs? So this is, in my opinion, an enduring mystery. So just to be clear, and I, uh, and I mean for recreational purposes. So I want to know, why do some people think other people should be punished for using drugs for non-medical purposes? So I'm looking at this individual difference question. And I'm going to be making an argument that we can understand variation in opposition to drug use 
by thinking about strategies. In particular, I'm going to be thinking about re reproductive strategy. Just to set this in context, and the political scientists in the room can tell me if I've got this wrong, here is the kind of argument against which we're trying to push. So my political scientist friends tell me, which I don't know if it's true, that the way to think about people's individual views on issues is that people have some kind of abstract political views, which we're going to measure with some abstract items. To what extent are you conservative? How often do you go to church? Um, do you consider yourself a Democrat or Republican? So on and so on. That people consult these uh, sort of commitments that they have in terms of their ideology. And that tells them, that causes their views on things like recreational drug use, and uh, their views on prostitution and promiscuity and so on. You can tell me afterwards if I've completely misrepresented the political, uh, the view from political science. So if, if this is true, if the sort of symbolic politics is view, symbolic politics view is true, then what we should do is if we measure people's symbolic political ideolog ideological commitments, we measure drug attitudes and we measure stuff like their sexual attitudes, then if we control for this, then the relationship between this and this should go away by virtue of the fact that they have the same causal antecedent. Very simple. We have a slightly different view, and this is now work in collaboration with my good friend and colleague, Jason Whedon. I want to go back to the issue of digital music rights, which I, which I alluded to at the top of my talk. If this view of morality is correct, then one way to think about moral, content, moral contents is to divide them roughly into two different kinds of classes. The first kind of class is what I'm going to call a Rawlsian content, which is that you have a particular moral rule, and under that particular moral rule, no one in the group is differentially harmed or helped by virtue of having that rule. So take the prohibition against intentional harm. So everyone who can be harmed benefits by living in a world in which other people are condemned for harming, right? So and. Anybody who can be harmed, which is everybody, benefits from those sorts of rules. Now, we're also constrained by those rules, right? So I would like to harm Michael so I can take his stuff. So I'm worse off in the sense that the moral regime prevents me from doing stuff. I don't really want to harm you to take your stuff. Um, I'm, I'm inhibited from what I can do, but I'm also protected, right? And that's true for everybody who can be harmed. So certain kinds of rules are no better or worse for the different people in the community. The Rawlsian in the sense that we all benefit equally from them. But there's other kinds of rules which I'm going to call strategic. So let's go back to the digital music, uh, pro uh, property rights over digital music. If I'm a producer of music, then I win in a regime in which my music is protected. That is, if you get punished for taking my digital music. Because then I can sell it to you and I can um, more easily make money from it and so on. Right? If I'm a digital music producer, I lose in a world in which I'm not allowed to protect it, in which everybody can take it, in which keeping it secret is moralized. Right? And so that means that what you would expect is that people should either be in favor of or opposed to certain moral contents depending on where they sit in strategic space. Right? Music producers should be in favor of uh, strong moral norms about and laws about digital music rights. People who consume it should be in favor of weak ones. So I'm not going to go through the whole argument here. Uh, but we're going to make a claim about reproductive strategy. Here's the intuition. The intuition is, uh, let's just use birds for a second, because people get bent out of shape about people. So uh, suppose there's two different kinds of birds in the world. So there's birds that are nice daddy birds. And what daddy birds do is that they heavily invest in their offspring. So they bring them worms and all sorts of stuff. And they, they have a monogamous mate. They're like penguins, and they bring them lots of stuff. And then there's these kind of, uh, ray, let's call them rayfish birds. So some male birds, they don't use any parenting effort. They just engage in mating effort. So they go around and they try to mate promiscuously with female birds, even the ones who are already mated. Okay. Now imagine there are moral rules that governed bird behavior in such that when you broke the rule, you got punished by the bird community. And let's say you have this moral rule that says um, uh, prom you know, having sex with someone outside, or outside of the monogamous bond is the bad thing to do. You get punished for that. Now, that's really good for dad birds who want to keep their mates faithful to them, even if there's these rayfish birds around trying to get matings. But that's really bad for promiscuous birds. Because the, the promiscuous birds, their whole reproductive strategy depends on putting out a lot of mating effort as opposed to parenting effort. What this suggests is that if you could poll birds, monogamous, heavily investing dad birds, 
would be in favor of rules that suppress promiscuity, and promiscuous birds, good-looking, sexy birds, would be opposed to all rules that suppressed promiscuity, right? So sexy birds like a world in which they don't get punished for lots of sex. Dad birds like rules that um, prevent other birds from having sex with their monogamous mates, which is a reproductive cost. So let's just suppose that it's true that to the extent that recreational drug use is common in a society, there's greater uh, pr promiscuity and uh, more short-term sexual transactions that are taking place. If that's true, then people's sexual strategy, whether they are monogamous investing males or promiscuous high mating effort males, ought to push around their views on all of those things that contribute to promiscuity, including drug use. So on this view, what's really going on is that the uncaused cause is not political ideology, but rather sexual stuff. Am I a sexy guy? And so on. This is causing drug attitudes, and it's bringing along abstract political commitments. And so then what should happen is that if you control for this, the relationship between sex stuff and drug attitudes is not going to go down. But if you control for this, then this relationship will be diminished. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of subjects. We're going to ask them their views on uh, their opposition to drugs. So we're going to ask about some uh, ideological commitments, religiosity. We're also going to ask about the sexual stuff. So there's a socio-sexuality socio scale, questions like sex without love is OK. How many partners have you had in the last three weeks or whatever it is? Um, and then a whole bunch of other items. The drug measure is very simple. A person's going to use blah, blah, blah. Is this wrong? Should it be illegal or legal? We ran two studies. Uh, the first one was with uh, undergraduates at the University of Central Florida. And the second one was, again, an online sample. This is the, uh, this is, these are mTurkers. So I'm just going to show you some data here to wrap up. So the first thing I want you to notice, all I'm doing here is showing you the raw correlations between the things that we measured, including religiosity, political ideology, and so on, including the ones that are important to us, sociosexuality, uh, and so on. These are, this is in the undergraduate sample. So the question is, what is the relationship between these measures and opposition to illegal drug use, or op opposition to drug use? And what you can see is that the best predictor of opposition to drug use is sociosexuality, how promiscuous you are, roughly. So if you're ever curious about someone's views, if you're in the United States, at least, our data are so far just domestic. Although now, actually, that's not true. We have the same pattern of data in um, Belgium and Japan now. Uh, yes, if you're shy about asking someone what their position is on illegal drugs, you can just ask them how many sexual partners they've had recently. Uh, and you can account for about a quarter of the variance that way. Uh, so what should happen is that uh, if we control for the non-sexual stuff, these things should stay relatively robust. But if you control for the sexual variations, these relationships ought to get a little bit smaller, which they do. And so uh, it could be that the undergraduate sample is funny. So we ran this again in an mTurk sample. And we see, if anything, slightly larger relationships between all the sexual stuff and the drug stuff. And we run the same sort of analyses. And we get the same kind of pattern of results. Oops. So what I want to say from this is that one way to start to understand moral contents is that this is basically the expression of a battle which is being waged. So in those kinds of contexts in which rules are not Rawlsian, in which people can get an advantage, a strategic advantage over others, by advocating or suppressing a particular kind of moral contents, we can see this as long as we understand what the strategic game is, is that's being played. So in the same way that the people use omissions in order to react strategically to other people's moral condemnation, people are using their particular point in strategic space to advocate for particular kinds of moral contents, which wind up being good for them, even if they can't articulate why that is. So taken together, what we want to say is that this idea that morality should be understood strategically affords a kind of set of new looks about how to think about moral contents, about how to think about moral behavior, and all of this, of course, is motivated by this notion that morality is not for making people better off. It's not for altruism. It's not for cooperation. It's not for caring for kin. It's really about playing the strategic games with one another. All this work wouldn't have been possible without some of my students, including my former student, Peter DeSholey, and especially Jason Whedon for this latter work. And so with that, I want to thank them. And I want to thank you for your attention today.